Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of In the Red with Curtis White. Before we dive into talking about the opening races to our European campaign in Rookvin and Namur and how we overcame the travel and jet lag to get here, I want to let you all know that this episode is sponsored by Whoop. Whoop is a personalized digital fitness, health, and recovery tool that I've been using for a couple of years and really throughout this entire season. The wristband and app have helped me monitor my recovery, my sleep, and overall health when I'm pushing my body to its limits in pursuit of my goals. It measures basic biometrics like resting heart rate, heart rate variability, respiratory rate, your daily strain, and with the new 4.0 band, skin temperature, and blood oxygen levels. This morning, actually, two days after back-to-back -back World Cups in Rookvin and Namur, I scored an 81% recovery score, which means I'm in the green, I slept well, I followed my recovery process to a T, and I'm recovered enough to get back to training and take on strain as I prepare for the upcoming races over here in Belgium. Whoop has helped me form healthier habits around my training, my traveling, and my racing, and really in life overall. To get in the green, you can go to whoop.com, that's W-H-O-O-P, and use the code in the red, no capitals, no spaces, so you can save on your first Whoop purchase. That's in the red to get in the green. I'll include that link in the show notes below. That's all I have for right now. Let's get in. Oh, the start line, Curtis White here from the Israels and Snow. And up there, drop on And ready to go here in Brazener. And we are underway. Van der Poel alongside Curtis White. Tonart right alongside him. And it's the American that gets a whole shot. Oops. Oh, 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 oh. That was rolled in. And yeah, on the last step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The coffee tasted good this morning. He's got a new podcast in the red. Love to see him with such a great start today. I know a lot of American fans are going to be really pumped by this. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of In the Red with Curtis White. I'm here in Siddard, in the Netherlands. We just wrapped up our first week here for the European block, our European campaign. Uh, first two World Cups of the trip, World Cup in Rookfin, and then the next day, World Cup in Namur on the sides of the Citadel. Lots of exciting racing to talk about, talking about adjusting to the time zone here, getting over the jet lag, getting back to training routines, all that good stuff. So, Tony, my friend, how are you? I'm good. I love, I love this. The racing is exciting. Rookvin was, was awesome. I mean, that finish, like that's, that's where it's at, man. That, that was the highest level sport right there. Just seeing like 300 meters to go pickaxe on the rivet, like Ely has him. He's, he's yeah. got him on the ropes. And then it's just like this all or nothing last ditch effort hopping at like significantly faster than Ely hopping the barriers. Um, that, that was such a cool thing. And you know, like, neither one of them had anything going through their heads. It's just yeah. like heart rates pinned on the ropes. And it's just like, that was a last ditch effort. You're either, you're going to make it or you're going to go to the hospital. That's it. <laughs> but that's, that's the highest level of sport right there. It was, so that was, it was just next level, man, to, to just pass him through the barriers like that is just, I, I, you couldn't script it better. You know, yeah. he's picking guys off, picking guys off. Like, mm -hmm. that guy's, but that, that, that was a good course for him. And he, he's really, he's really quick and responsive on the pedals. And then, the next day it was the opposite side of the spectrum. You know, you had a really fast ripping slippery course. And then you had this, this heavy diesel effort on the sides of the Citadel and the Mur. Um, you know, it, it was on Saturday in Rookvin, it was you versus your competitors more and then in the Mur, it's you versus the course almost. And it's just, it's, it's the other side of the spectrum. It's like this iconic cyclocross race that we've been doing for so many years. And I, it's, it, we'll get into more because it's it's funny how that race has changed that course has changed over the years uh, they had a little bit uh different layout of the course this year they seem to make more tweaks than the average belgian cyclocross course number does but they've made some really unique changes um and the course has changed over the years so it's all, all really exciting things to kind of go over and talk about yeah i like the idea that it stays kind of the same um, 
I think, I don't know about the highest levels for you guys, but it seems like in, in the US, because it's such an amateur model, it's always about changing it up to make it interesting. So amateurs want to come back and try something different, which I get, but I kind of like the idea that like you have decades of people racing, you know, essentially the same course. Like that's, that's, a, that's cool. So I'm curious to see for you to explain how it, how it changes, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was a fun re weekend of racing and it just gets better from here. So this is, yeah. this is it. I can't wait to see uh, Wout and Matthew come back in and, and, you know, see the battles that are coming. So. This weekend in Dendermonde. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be, Good and stuff. we're looking at rain for uh Friday, Saturday, Sunday, leading into the race. You excited about that? You had a great result there last year. You ran for like 20 minutes of the race or something last year. Actually, though, no exaggerations. It was probably about like 17, 18 minutes of the race yeah, was yeah. running. It, it was about three minutes a lap we were running in Dendermonde. Um, and that was just the course. Was, last year, we had this um, epic storm roll in Storm Bella. Uh, almost at noon, the day of the race, they had to make the call of whether they or not they were going to go forward with the race. Um, the The parking... We were going to park all the vehicles in a field and that was flooded out. So it's for, it, it was just, a, the parking was a mess. The logistics were a mess. They, they had this big flyover that they were going to put the race up and over. And with the high winds, it's, it was just unsafe to put people 30 feet in the air on a flyover. So it's, they kept the race grounded. They made all the alterations they needed to, and they're able to run the race. We're running through shin deep mud. And um, for me, that was my best career world cup result with 13th. So I'm hoping to improve on that. Um, starting off the week though, not my best results, but it's, it's also coming off of the national championships. That was last Sunday, getting on a plane Monday, red eye over to Brussels arriving Tuesday. So there was kind of that urgency to like, try and get a little sleep on the plane. And, uh, it was, yeah. And then trying to adjust as quickly as possible, get into your routines, control your environment, try and get all the right food in that you need, get on a good training regimen, restrict the sleep when you need to. Um, and then just when it's race day, you just, you, you're hoping for the best trust that you've done all that you can and given it your all. So it was, it, it was interesting to start off the European campaign with a really fast race because normally we start off with a race like namur that it's it's you versus the course more than you you versus your competitor so it's you had to be really sharp off the line positioning was important uh right after the whole shot in my race there was a crash that i got tangled up behind and i you know put a foot down was able to get around it i didn't go down in the crash but it held me up so it, like already kind of on the back foot and i, I had to focus more on riding the course well holding good position in the group and using that to my advantage to slingshot to the next group or trying to hold that forward momentum or gain that forward momentum so I can keep making up spots in the most efficient way. Because it's when it's more group racing, it's it, it's easy to waste a lot of matches, to burn a lot of matches like that. So you just got to be a little bit more meticulous about it. And it's it, you're surging a bit more. Whereas in Namur, you had this diesel effort and you kind of ramped it up slowly as you got towards the end and you really had to pace it well so yeah i saw you ride through that crash if people go back and watch the replay there's a pretty good shot of you coming kind of through it and around it pretty pretty smooth for for what you could do uh which was nice not to see you get tangled yeah, up for what i could do yeah <laughs> right but obviously it still held you up a little bit um when you say when you say you burn more matches in that kind of racing, what's that from? Is it because you're so concerned with getting through to the next group? Is it because you know it, it, it delays sort of being patient, especially if you're you're toward the back, or what causes, or just because you're around other riders and you're reacting to their pace? Like what is causing that uh, that to happen? Yeah, I mean, sometimes you're reacting to other riders, but I think it's you, there's more of this like anxiousness that you have and this sense of urgency of, I need to get back as quick as possible. Um, and when the race is that high paced, it's, it, it's easier for you to make mistakes. And something that maybe the cameras didn't pick up a lot or as much as it was, was it, it was, it was actually kind of slick in those corners. Uh, it was a pretty flat course, uh, had some unique features, the, the pinwheel of death or the spiral of death. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it, I'm not was, a, what do you what, what, what do you think about that you like riding that i'm not a fan of, of the pinwheels I, I don't think it it adds much from a visual fan perspective 
uh, and it looks kind of gimmicky, but I don't know, whatever. But I, um, I mean, it, it, it kills about a minute of the, the race there. And you, you're kind of, it was interesting because I was trying to follow uh, one rider that had a really good weekend. I thought was a uh, Swiss rider, uh, Timon Rugg, who you know, I'm, he's a buddy of mine and he's had some really, really strong rides. He actually just had a career best result in the Mur, um, finishing 10th. I mean, a top 10 in the World Cup is awesome, but he he had to come back. He actually went down in that crash in the start and he had that forward momentum. He was chasing back and I was trying to follow him as much as I could in Rookfin. Uh, and he was going through the pinwheel faster than me. And he, he's a bit smaller of a rider. He has a lower center of gravity. He's able to lean it just right and kind of get the traction and hook up just right. But he was able to go through that section and you're just, you're turning. It's kind of this like, decreasing radius the entire time and you're just like you, you want to kind of lean more with the shoulders keep the bike upright maintain that traction patch and pedal as much as you can without sliding out and trying not to get dizzy and then you get to the middle and then you reverse your turning then you make your way out and it's because it's a you know an increasing radius now you're kind of gaining speed as you start to get closer and closer to the exit and you're still getting dizzy and you're still trying to hold the wheel and lean with the shoulders and keep the bike upright and maintain your traction patch and all these things are going on but it did kill about like 45 seconds to about a minute and the cameras were on that point it was like it was a cool image i think for the viewers and for the spectators and actually well they didn't have spectators on site the netherlands um they're allowing sporting events to happen without spectators and that will be the case for the World Cup in Holst um, coming up after the new year. And actually over the weekend, uh, the Dutch decided to go into a harder lockdown here in the Netherlands. Um, so it looks like we're going to be in a similar situation as to where we were last year, where everything is closed except for the grocery stores. So it's really just focusing on our process, training, resting, going to the grocery store when we need to. Um, and keeping a tight circle. And that's just, that's, that's the way we're living right now and trying to make it through our season. And it is nice to have more Americans over here. Uh, we have a number of Americans here in the, the Watersley Sittard complex. Uh, Magali Rochette is in the house next door to us. Uh, Gage Heck, Lance Haydet, a bunch of the, the development riders of USA Cycling are over and a couple houses over. So it's just, it's a nice little community that we're able to engage with on a regular basis uh, and go to the races with. So it's just, that's a little piece of home that we're able to keep here in lockdown. So are you, um, are they requiring the same type of testing as last year or because of the vaccinations, they don't need to do that? No, they're not requiring the, the testing as much. Um, it, it's, it's, if you're vaccinated and you, you have the QR code and you're able to scan all that stuff, then it's, you're within the rules there. Um, but it's, it, it's, I think with the more vaccines that are being rolled out, it's everyone kind of understands that it's we're, we're a little bit closer to kind of getting back to normal, but it's still everyone's cautious. No one wants to get sick or test positive. And it's just, it's, we're, we're still being cautious with it. Um, and especially now it's, we had the, the fans were there in full force in Demur, which was really cool. Um, that, that was something that I think we all really missed last year. Uh, we went from racing in Rookfin where they weren't allowed to have fans and then the Mur, and it's just the, the cowbells, the, the chainsaws going. And it just, it, it's it, it, like that atmosphere was something that everyone really missed. And it really, it, it helps us athletes really push our limits um, and get the most out of ourselves and to perform at the highest level. So it's just, that was something that we'd missed, but you know, you know, as things progress, you know, the, it's out of our control. So all we can do is continue to just react to it in the, the best and safest way that we can. So we can continue to continue to compete. And, you know, the end, the biggest goal for the season now is the world championships in Arkansas. So that's, you know, making it there in top form. That's, that's what we're gunning for. All right. So, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about Rookfin and then get into um, <clears throat> Namur. Uh you kind of give us a little bit of breakdown of the race sort of early on. How does it play once you get through the crash and kind of get, you know, back into your groove a little bit? Yeah. So it's, I started to talk a little bit about how the course is a little bit more slick. And then we went on a rant about the, the pinwheel, the spiral. Naturally, well, there, there, there was a cool shot that, uh, you know, from the top, it actually looks like it's a little hypnotic. Like it, it's just like, it's, <laughs> um, 
but it, it, it was a bit more slick than the the broadcasting led on to be so but with a course that's that fast and at that level everyone's on grifo tires and if you run something a little bit heavier than a grifo let's say a baby limus there's that much added rolling resistance where you're putting out 30 extra watts on a straightaway and that just adds up so much quicker um so it's almost it's better to train to control your bike in these adverse conditions and get comfortable sliding a little bit or, or training yourself to maintain that traction so you can run a faster rolling tire and keep up with the wheel in front of you. Cause the races are just, it's, I can't state enough just how fast they are. And especially we're coming off a travel, a transatlantic flight and kicking things off with a really fast cross race. Um, you, you really had to be on top of it. So it's, I was running the Grifo tires that I believe, um, I think I was at 18, 19 PSI. It was relatively low because it, there were some bumps in the course, but you really needed to maintain the traction. And that, that was for how fast it was. That was a good tire pressure for me. Um, we had some interesting features there off camber, uh, a pretty deep sand pit. Um, it was just all about kind of maintaining that forward momentum. So when you're racing in the group, there is sometimes this accordion effect that the accelerations are a bit harsher when you're on the back of a group of say six or seven riders, than it would be on the front. So I, I had to be pretty cognizant about where I was in the group. I wanted to keep within the top two wheels of the group I was in. Even if I was setting the pace, I knew everyone had to they, they were riding my pace unless someone wanted to come around me. So I tried to learn what I could from the wheels around me, what lines they were taking. Um, if I needed to make any adjustments myself or how to ride the course, but up until the last couple laps, that, that was really the name of the game and trying to, to frog leap those groups. And there was a point where I was actually, there were several laps where I felt like I was within 10 to 15 seconds of, the group in front of me was fighting for maybe 15th place, but it was, it, it was a big enough group where like I could just see the tail end in front of me and I had to really gauge that effort just right to kind of make that juncture, but I couldn't do it alone. So I had to really bide my time, be patient, um, and make sure I was in good position in my group. So I wasn't wasting energy. So I could make that effort later in the race. Um, and then it just, it, the last couple laps I was riding with Ben Turner, who, uh, on Trinity, super strong guy. For those who don't know Ben Turner, he recently signed with Ineo. So it's, uh, you know, he, he's no joke. He's the real deal. So <laughs> following that wheel was, uh, you know, it, it, that was, it, it definitely opened me up for Nimmer. We'll, we'll just say that. <laughs> Is it a shock to the system when you jump into that race? Um, I mean, just to, even aside from the travel, just coming, you know, you obviously raced some world cups and in some fe tough fields already this year. And would you, was it a shock once you get in there, even if you haven't been in there in a while? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been my last race. There was the world championships the first weekend of February last year. So it's been, you know, 10 and a half months and you try to replicate that in the States and you, 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 you know, put yourself in a good mental place. You're, you're aggressive. You're looking to take risks and chances. And even like at the national championships where we had a rider who was at a higher level, there was only one or two riders that are at that level in Europe. It's every, it, 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 you have so many riders at such a high level that are willing to take your line or, or to, you know, to, to take any advantage that they can get. Um, you know, a development rider on the Cannondale Cyclocross World Team, AJ August, who's over in Europe right now with the Eurocross Academy program. They, um, Jeff Proctor does a really good job with uh, cultivating this atmosphere where you know, it, it, you're not just developing the athlete, you're developing the person. And all of his athletes that he takes over to Europe, they write um, blogs for it. In the past, we've done it for us, uh, CX Magazine. Uh, but they were doing it with cycling news this year. And AJ August uh, posted a journal entry, his blog. Um, and it, it was just a really unique perspective of it was her, his first time in Europe opening his European career at a young age 
with a race like Namur, which is one of the most iconic and difficult tracks that we'll ever race. Um, and, and it was, it, I felt like that piece that he wrote is almost a testament to the, the importance of junior development for this sport and why we should value it and continue to invest in it because it's my career, my, my European racing career started with, uh, well, actually the day before I ever first, I, I did Namur when I was a junior, we did a small Belgian farm field race in Lichterveld and the next day we did Namur. So it's, you know, the pendulum swung all the way to the other end and you finally, it's this reality check of, wow, this is what, this is what top sport is. This is the level I need to be at. This is what I expect of myself. And this is what I need to train to every single day and aspire to. And this is what I need to get used to. So I, I think that that was, it was a really, it was a great piece that AJ wrote. Um, if you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to, and typically uh, Jeff's athletes that he brings over, they're putting out every athlete puts out a blog post or a journal entry. You know, it seems like they're going to be doing them with cycling news. So just keep an eye out for those. Uh, it's a really unique perspective and it's not with USA cycling. Both programs do a really good job bringing over athletes and exposing them to the highest levels of sport and giving them the resources to succeed. Um, but this is just, it's another channel to follow young American athletes over here. So yeah, it's nice that there's uh, two programs in the States doing it. So we have more kids and, and AJ's, AJ's a great kid. He's a, he's a local kid, um, for my area. So I've seen him racing bikes since he could walk probably, um, and just a, a super good kid. So it's awesome to see him over there. I did read the piece. He did a great job. So, yeah. So let's talk about Namur. Namur. Yeah. The Citadel de Namur. <laughs> Is it, I mean, one of your favorites. Uh, what's the what's the feeling going into there? I mean, you gotta you gotta be both tired and excited. Is it is it kind of a bummer that it's the first weekend and you haven't been able to truly make your transition yet, or does it not really matter? I I mean, we talked a little bit in the last episode of how at the top of sport or generally athletes kind of need to reframe things and kind of alter their perception of things, not just, you know, just to kind of, we need to keep ourselves in it and kind of convince ourselves of like, look, the travel that I can't do anything about that. I've done everything I could. I've adjusted as well as I can. I'm going to forget about the the three hours of sleep I got on the plane or the screaming babies that were a couple of rows over for me that kept me up for most of the flight um, or, or, or the other things that are out of my control. All of that, you got to push it out and kind of say, for the last four days, I've committed to doing things at a very high level to my process, to my training, to my recovery, making sure I'm bringing my best to this block. Let's kick it off, 100%. Let's go. That, that's all you can do. And you kind of have to come into a block like this with fewer expectations. Um, and, I, and I came away with the 25th place, which off the plane in Rookfin, um, well, off the plane a few days earlier than with Rookfin, one of the fastest races uh, that we'll probably do over here. It's a respectable result. Uh, some mistakes were made, but again, it's at that level, you're going to make mistakes and you got to move on. You can't dwell on them too much. Focus on... The, the positives that you can take out of that. And then Namur is a fresh opportunity. So I felt like, you know what? Now I'm opened up. I can really, I, I, I've done Namur many, many times uh, and I know how to pace this effort. Um, I started off really well in Namur. It, it, w the start was shifted back to kind of where the original start was, where it was at the bottom of this cobbled climb and it's nearly four or 500 meters just up the side of the Citadel, full gas. And it's, it's, you're absolutely exhausted by the time you get to the top. And there's a bottleneck, you know, everyone's out of the saddle for the entire start. And it bottlenecks at the top where you get off the climb. It's a bridge up to the pavement and it's a bottleneck over the bridge. I think I was maybe 12th wheel coming up to the bridge and the, the, the cameras didn't get it. They were slow to pan over there, but as it bottlenecked, I was on the far outside on the left side 
and I got pinched a little bit. There wasn't a shove. It was just a lean because there was that bottleneck in the field. There's all these guys looking to go for a very tight gap. And the front wheel was pushed off the bridge. And I was pinned between the barricade and the bridge. So my wheel is off the bridge. I come to a dead stop. The forward momentum, just it's gone. And that there's guys past me on the right. It's tight and I'm getting shoved. And I just, I got to kind of shove back, create a little space so I can get the front wheel back on track, run up the bridge. And by that time I'm, you know, I lose 20 places, but it's, it's such a heavy track that you can, you can take a deep breath and say, all right, patience, come on, just get your head back into it. Take a deep breath and race the course. I had a really strong surge over the next lap, lap and a half, where I was able to get back in almost within the top 20. Uh, but I felt like it was, I, I almost did that too quickly because it's such a, it, there's so much elevation on this course where it's, you're doing probably, I, I'd guess 1500 feet of climbing over the course of the race. It's, it's, it's a, tr it's a tremendous amount of elevation gain that, you know, throughout this lap. Um, and it's very easy to go into the red and it's a very technical race. And there's a lot of rocks and roots that you need to look for. And over the course of the years with us racing the same track over and over again, the course gets worn down. So more rocks and roots are continuing to be exposed over recent years. And um, the off camber that we were using for the last 10, 15 years, or however long they've done this course last year, it was very clear that the off camber was easier. It was faster. There wasn't ruts anymore. It's been so trodden down that it's just shelves. So you're able to go down this off camber, absolutely flying. So this year they shifted the line up a little bit to fresh ground. So you, you needed to be a little bit more composed through some of these features. They added a, an interesting off camber and drop into the, the cobblestone climb there are a couple of drops that had very you know, precarious roots and rocks hidden that you really need to maneuver. Well, um, it, it was more of a mountain biking course. And I felt like I was, uh, you know, I was able to handle the bike well, but it's when you go into the red, you're just see that this is the bad in the red, you know, you're, you're too far <laughs> in the red, you know, we love being in the red on this show, but that's when you, you go a little bit too far and you need to kind of recalibrate before you make a mistake. And it's very easy to, and I've done that on this course where, I just, I ex overextend and you just, you lose composure and you slip on a route or you miss the rut and you just, you wipe out and you, it takes a while to collect yourself. And it's such a heavy track that it takes a while to get your momentum back. Um, but that's, that, that's kind of the name of the game on this course. So kind of knowing how to ride within yourself. So after a couple laps, I started to feel like I overextended. I had to pull it back a little. And, uh, you know, I was in that group for 25th or so. And I, you know, put, put my place out of my mind right now. I just, I, I wanted to get the most out of this effort so I can continue to learn, grow, acclimate to the climate and just get the most out of this effort. So laps three and four, I felt like I started to go backwards a little bit, but the last, especially the last two laps, I felt like I was really able to ramp up that effort. And the last three laps, I, I was with, uh, Swiss guy, Gilles Mottier from the, the Legendaire cross team. Um, he's a mountain biker. He was able to ride this course pretty proficiently. And I felt like I was able to learn some things from him. Um, and especially the last two laps, like I said, we were able to really ramp up that effort. Uh, and in the final lap, I was able to make up some, some solid ground and make it back up to Julia Bertolini, um, the Italian champion who, we're the exact same age. We've been racing against each other since we were 17. Uh, and I was in the fight for 22nd and closing in on Jens Adams, who's a, a strong racer, racer in his own right. So um, I felt like I was really able to pace the effort well. I had the depth to kind of rebound after but almost overextending, correct that mistake, and then surge it in, uh, in the final couple laps and get the most out of the effort. And I mean, for me, 23rd is I, that's a result I can be happy with, um, for where I am this block, I think with coming over from the U S and kicking things off with a double weekend, two world cups finishing with 23rd number, um, that's, that's a result I can be proud of. It's something that I, 
I'm continuing to aim higher. Um, I, I can, I, I always want to get the most out of my, my efforts and myself, but this is something that I think I can be proud of. Yeah. It looked like a solid weekend for, especially all the, all the factors that you're taking into account. I mean, you're jumping right back in with the big dogs and, but you held up well. And that's, um, that's good promise for, for the coming block. Um, how about, how about training in, in this week? What do you do at this point now? You've, you've got those two races in, you've maybe had the physical and mental adjustment, um, from just being back in those fields. Uh, now you got to kind of take care of yourself and, and get ready to get in that grind. Um, what do you do this week to, to recover, to train? What's that look like? So I think it's last week. It was a lot of, not a lot of this, but to, to acclimate to the time zone, I, it, you have to kind of restrict your sleep a little bit. Um, it's pretty easy to kind of overextend with the sleeping, you know, you get three hours of sleep on the plane and then you get 13 hours the next night and then you're up all night the following night. So you really want to kind of restrict your sleep for the, the first couple of nights, you know, nine hours is great clock in clock out. You know, you want to be up early enough to, you know, when the sun comes up, spend as much time in the sun as you can. Um, and it takes about a week to really make sure that you're on a good routine with that after hard efforts like that. Uh, we're, we're tired enough to where we're going to bed early um, set the alarm for seven 30 in the morning and you're able to kind of get functioning, um, on a normal routine. So this week I feel like I'm able to commit to a pretty normal week of training and we race Namur on Sunday and the next race we have is Sunday and Dundamon. So it's a full week of being able to recover and get in the training that we need. Um, during this period, especially after Dendamond, the racing is really going to ramp up. So I want to make sure that I'm continuing to stay on the endurance training just to make sure that I'm getting that aerobic work in um, so I don't get tired or fade off uh, later in this block because we still have the travel back to the States and the world championships that we need to look forward to. So making sure that I'm getting in uh, the running, the stability work, and the aerobic training on the bike. Um, cause we're, we're, we're racing so much that, yeah, it's great to train the skills, but we're racing so much that we don't need to be hyper-focused on skills and interval training during this period. So making sure that, you know, I'm, I'm taking the time to get in that, that aerobic depth and that endurance, um, a day like today, actually, I was out for three and a half hours with Scott Funston, who it was, it's getting pretty cold here. We woke up to light dusting and frost on the ground and we went for an endurance cross ride where we were able to stay on mostly trails, moving a little bit slower out of the wind, um, and kind of getting creative with how we get in that, that training and kind of a lot of pedaling in a, you know, I mean, mixing it up with some trails off road. Um, it's always a nice way to just kind of get the training in, in a, in a fun way and not, you know, not being on the cold roads for three and a half, almost four hours. So speaking of, of world, as you've mentioned it a couple of times during uh, this podcast, um, I just listened to uh, Bill's interview with Jeremy Powers. I don't know if you listened to that yet. Yeah, oh, that was an awesome, awesome yeah, podcast. Great interview. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have listened to it. I'm sure we share a, a very, you know, a very big amount of our audience is listening to both, I hope. Um, so uh, one of the things that they brought up that I thought was really interesting, and if, if you haven't heard it, you know, I'm not going to try to go through their their anal uh, analysis of it, people should go check that out. But um, they were kind of comparing the the world championships in the U.S. in 2014 versus today. And Bill asked the question of Jeremy, like about his preparation and what that meant to him and kind of speculated on what it means to you guys a little bit. Um, so I'll, with that sort of speculative question that he did ask, I kind of wanted to, to piggyback off that and ask you that in terms of in your career right now, what does that world championship mean? Um, I know, you know, Powers gave his answer to that, and I'm not asking you to compare yourself to him. He was at a different point in his career. He was older a little bit at the time, and there's a number of different factors there. But, but just for you, how important is that? Is it had pressure? Um, is it something you're thinking like, I, I don't know when there could be another U.S. one in your elite career? You know, I mean, what, it's been seven or eight years. So, you know, I mean, what is the likelihood of you getting a, another one in? Um, what was your experience at the first one? So I'm just kind of curious what, how you've thought about that as an athlete. 
Yeah. I, I, so I, I'm, I was fortunate enough to compete in the first world championships that came to the U S in Louisville. I was a last year junior and I believe my result in the day was 11th. Uh, I, I almost cracked the top 10. It was a fight down to the end and I just missed that, I believe. But, um, it, it was, I remember kind of the icons of the sport at that time were just, it, it, it was, it was a massive deal to have the world championships come to the U S and, you know, maybe when I'm, you know, I was 17, I didn't fully understand the gravity of that, but that was, that was a real opportunity for our spark to grow and kind of reach new heights and bring as many people into the fold as we could. And, um, you know, now it's several years later, um, the sports in a bit of a different place here in the U S but I still see that as it, it's a massive honor and privilege to, to pursue that and to have that opportunity to continue to promote the sport in our country and to try and grow the sport. Um, and it's, you know, over the last few years, since this was announced, I've had, you know, my, my three, two and one year goals have been geared towards the world championships. Um, you know, I wanted to, you know, three or four years ago, I saw the announcement and I told myself I wanted to be in a metal contention position. And everything that I did between now and then was going to be with that goal in mind. Um, I think the pandemic has disrupted a lot of that. And at that point, that's something that was one of the last things I was, that was on my mind. I think that was the last thing on a lot of people's minds. Uh, but it's one of those things in life that's out of your control and you roll with the punches and you continue to just do the best that you can with what you have. And uh, with the tools that I had, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the effort and the growth that I've made between then and now. Um, and it's, for me, it, it's, it, it's a privilege um, to be able to compete with the world championships on your home soil. And it's, it's something that I want to bring my best to. So and it's, we talked a little bit last week about kind of the weight that a national championship brings and the effort that goes into that. And just the process of living for sport, it's, um, you know, it, it's challenging at times because, and, and you, you really have to shut out a lot of the real world to kind of create your own little bubble and it, it, it you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, what we do is a blessing, right? So, you know, all we can do is to, to use this opportunity the best we can and to, at the end of the day, promote the sport that we love. Um, so for that, I, yeah, I want to bring my best foot forward and perform at my best. That's, that's the long answer to your question, Tony. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good answer. And, and, you know, I thought it was a good question and a good um, analysis from those guys. And I said, everybody should go check it out and listen to what they have to say themselves. But of course, you know, listen, and it's, I mean, listen powers is an it. athlete that it, he and yeah. I were, you know, when I first came into the fold as a young under 23 and elite, we were, we were rubbing shoulders. He was at the height. He was wearing the, the stars and stripes. He was Kingpin. And I was the young gun that was, you know, <laughs> who are you? You're in my line. Get out <laughs> of my way. And, and that's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of funny now that I'm older and I look at some younger racers coming up that are racing aggressively. Like I'm, I'm young enough to where I still remember it. Like, ah, that, that used to be me not too long ago. And then I'm old enough to think, Oh, these kids get out of my way. <laughs> but, um, you know, he's, he's been a very positive influence in my career. Um, and he, he has a lot of experience with sport at the highest level and, you know, being able to, to influence people, um, you know, and have an impact on folks and get them involved in the sport. So, um, and of course, you know, the work that he does with GCN and the commentating and you know, just his perspective in general, uh, in that interview, I really enjoyed cause it's, you know, it, you know, I, I felt like he and Bill had a really, really interesting conversation. It was a productive conversation. And I hope that, um, listeners were, are, are able to get a, a, a different perspective of, of where things are with the sport in the U S yeah, definitely. So what else we got to know? Fan questions? Fan questions. So we touched on a little bit of these already. Um, the first one from Sam says, you guys always do such a great job with race recaps. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Sam. Uh, what, PSI, <laughs> what PSI were you running at Namur? 
I was running 24, 25 PSI, which typically for muddy race is really high. Um, I was running full Limus tires, 24, 25 PSI, but I was talking a little bit earlier about how the course has changed over the course of you know the last 10 years that I've done this. And as the racers are on the track, a lot of the sections are keep being used year after year after year. It's muddy. The tires, you know, they form their lines, tear up the dirt, the rain washes it away. Um, and a lot of rocks and roots are being exposed. So it's, it's turning more into a mountain bikey type of track. And unfortunately you saw a lot of flat tires. Most of the riders that were going into the pits, you needed, um, clean bike every couple of laps, but you did see a lot of pitcock flatted on the first lap on the, on the rooted section, right after the, the, the top of the climb. I don't know if you can call it a whole shot because it was a straight line for 400 meters at, you know, on an uphill climb, but, uh, you know, after the first couple of turns, Pickock flatted and he went into the pits on the first lap. And that was one of those sections that it was a danger point. You really had to look after your equipment and protect your equipment. So, uh, and this is something that I've learned over the last couple of years. And a lot of riders are in the same boat where we're running at quite a bit higher tire pressure to protect the equipment, running a little bit more aggressive of a tire, like a Limus to make sure we have that bite, that traction, even with the higher pressure to protect the equipment. So it's, it, it was a lot of this track was about driving the bike well and making good line choices and kind of finessing the bike in these transitions and over the rocks and roots. So we're not, you know, smashing a rim, rupturing a tubular, all those things. So it, it's, it, it's a, a bit, something we don't often see because tubulars are meant to really absorb that impact. And they're, they're much uh, more versatile and sturdy of a tire than a tubeless or certainly a clincher, but it's still a piece of the equipment that we have to look after. So All right. that was a good question. It is a good question. And when we're talking about courses, one of the things Curtis told me before we started was he's having a little internet issue. So he hasn't gotten his course pre-rides up yet um for the week but um we're hoping to see those soon and, and hopefully next week we can we can see it and talk about it a little bit too because that always helps me you know i watch the races but i like the pre-rides because then we can really break it down a little bit and really understand what the courses look like so mm -hmm. next week hopefully we'll get a little bit more of those as curtis gets settled and gets all those tech stuff in order um all right nancy asks on jet lag issues how do you cope with traveling back and forth so you talked a little bit about how it affected you um, any strategies, um, other than monitoring the sleeping that you use to, to deal with it? So <clears throat> really just forming healthy habits. Um, and it's restricting the sleep is one of those things that it's, I can't overstate it enough because there are a lot of athletes that feel, Oh, I didn't sleep enough on the plane ride over. And I'm going to sleep as long as I can the night I get there, or I'm going to take a nap when I land. And that's probably the worst thing you can do. The quickest way to adjust to another time zone is being outside, moving around as much as you can. And just it, ultimately the, the, the ideal situation is being in the sun. Um, December in Holland and Belgium, you're not always going to get that, but we we've been fortunate. We've had some good weather here. Um, but trying to go to bed early enough and waking up early enough so you can be proactive earlier. Um, I make a big pot of coffee uh, every morning. So that, 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 de that definitely helps uh, trying to get out the door early for training. Um, you know, other than that, really looking at the, the recovery scores, my whoop and making sure that I am adjusting accordingly because the, the plane ride over, you can physically see, Oh, two and a half hours of sleep. I got to stay up all day and the strain's pretty high and it kind of, the hours are thrown off a little bit and you got to get, you know, readjusted, but you can physically, or I've been able to physically see when catching up on sleep, my body forces itself to spend more time in deep and REM sleep than I normally would be. I feel like when I'm recovered and I'm on top of it, the balance kind of shifts back towards, you know, I'm able to spend an appropriate amount of time in light REM and deep sleep, but I can physically, uh, I can see on the app that I'm spending more time in deep sleep because the body is forcing itself to shut down to adjust. So 
I feel like after the week, I'm kind of noticing that shift back towards a normal, normal sleep cycles in the whoop app that I'm able to track. So that's, um, yeah, that, that's something that I, I, am very interested in actually seeing that in the whoop app and then, uh, just tracking the resting heart rate, the respiratory rate, um, especially, you know, we're still in the pandemic. So just kind of it having that overall monitor of health and the biometrics through that app. So it's, that's, um, all those little things add up. And if you kind of, if you neglect one little step, it, it, it affects things negatively. So, all right. That's another, it, it, another good question, but it's, it's a very complex answer. And there are a lot of lessons that I've had to learn over the years where it's just, it's trial and error. Um, some, you know, th there have been times where I just, I, I land, I didn't sleep at all. Uh, th there were a couple of crying babies in the, the section that I was sitting in and I need to take a nap. And then all of a sudden I wake up two hours later and it just, it throws off the sleep cycle quite a bit, but it's the, the best thing you can do is be walking around as much as you can. Um, if you can get out for a bike ride or for a walk or for a hike, just something, just move around, stay in the sun as much as you can in the light and stay up till nine o'clock. That's generally the point that we, you know, after nine o'clock, it's kind of this team effort. Everyone keeps each other up. We're playing cards or just anything to keep us engaged. Um, then after nine o'clock, you can go to bed, crash, but you're up at seven 30. All right. Well, with that said, for people who don't know, it is after nine o'clock where Curtis is right now, what was recording this. Uh, so um, I think we're going to wrap up here and let him get some sleep. I know it's a lot of stress for him to be able to, to log in and, and do these while he's over there. It, it was much more difficult last week yeah, than it was this week. So that, that's a good sign that I'm, I'm adjusting well. But um, yeah, you know, it, it, it was great to kind of hash out Ruckfin, Namur, especially with a course like Namur, that just there's so much history with, you know, not just, you know, the race that it has, but with Americans at that race. Um, the American women have done very well at a course like Namur. Katie Compton, from what I can see on cross results, has won it four times. Um, Katie Keogh has had several top tens between 2013 and 2018. Clara was third last year. Katarina Nash, even though she's not an American, we still love her. Uh, she's an adopted American. She's won it before. Um, and on the men's side, I, I think from what I've seen, Hyde has had the best result there, the top man with 11th. And that was in 2017. Powers has had strong rides there. Paige has had very consistent top 20 rides there over the years. And it, it's just, there's a lot of, it, it, it's kind of one of those races where it's just, it's for your, to compete at the highest level here, you need the foundational experience of a race like Namur because it is you versus the course. And when you can kind of gauge that effort, right, then you can start to move on to the challenge of you versus your competitors. So as we start to move into uh, more races during the curse period here where we have Dendermonde, we have Zolder, we have Lowenhout, uh, Ball, Hulst, Herentals. I'm sure I'm missing a couple in there, but it's, um, you know, it, this is a period that, and also a lot of these Europeans, they have their national championships coming up in a couple of weeks. So they're, they're, they're coming back from training camp and they're on good form now. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's sport at the highest level. And I hope everyone's able to tune along and watch it. Best time of the year to be a cross fan. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad you talked about how important it is though with Namur. I was trying to, I was trying to explain that this weekend as we were watching the race with my, my brother and my wife, my wife just looks at me and goes, she said, she goes, you say that about every race, every race is that important. <laughs> nah, but this one's different. <laughs> I know that's what I was trying to say, but I was fumbling around. It didn't work. So I'm going to just play her this. See, Curtis agrees with me. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, yeah, Tony, I think that's uh, that, that about wraps it up for this week. Um, we have a little bit of a break before the next race. We only have one race this weekend. Uh, but after Dendemonde, it's, it's full gas. Yeah, man. Well, All Merry the way till after the new year. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays to everyone. And um, really appreciate you all listening and... Uh, yeah, we'll catch you soon. Before I log off, just want to give everyone a quick reminder. If you haven't done so yet, please like, share, subscribe, 
wherever you get your podcasts. That really helps us get the word out, help grow the show. We love sharing our passion for, for cyclocross and promoting the sport and getting as many people involved as we can. So if there's any way we can do that, 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 that's fine by me. So that's all I have for this week. Take care, stay healthy, keep riding. We'll catch you all next week.